Hey nerds, Farmer Jesse here. Got a great video for you all this week and one that's uh, pretty close to my heart. Quick background, many years ago before I ever started farming, I was working in wine sales in New York City and I fell in love with a specific type of wine. They were biodynamic. Honestly, I was going through a small crisis at the time because I only sort of liked wines, despite it being my profession. But whenever I tasted a biodynamic wine, it was just different. It was just richer and more full of life. It got to the point that I could almost taste when a grower used biodynamic methods based on the wine's quality. Anyway, I became obsessed with biodynamic agriculture and eventually left my job in New York City to work on a great biodynamic vegetable farm in Southern Kentucky called Bug Tussle Farm. Great farm, great name. And right down the road was a guy named Jeff Poppin, known as the Barefoot Farmer, who is a leading voice in the biodynamic movement here in the United States and hosts the Southeast Biodynamic Conference every year at his farm around the first week of October. Always an amazing event, which I will link in the show notes. And frankly, Jeff is one of the most knowledgeable vegetable growers I've ever met. Similar to how I felt about the wines, Jeff produces some of the best produce I've ever tasted and has been one of my mentors for the last like 15 years. Anyway, Jeff has written a new book on biodynamics, also linked in the show notes. So I thought I would have Jeff on here to talk a bit about biodynamics for anyone who, like I was 20 years ago, is like bio to what now? In this video, Jeff is gonna give us a quick overview of what biodynamics is, talk a little about the man who started it in the 1920s named Rudolf Steiner and show us around his farm, and his low-till methods, which he has a fun name for. So sit back and enjoy Jeff Poppin of Long Hungry Creek Farm in Red Bowling Springs, Tennessee, geeking out about plant science and talking biodynamic agriculture. Today I'd like to talk a little bit about how we can use the principles of biodynamics in our gardens. This way of farming arose out of the introduction of chemical agriculture a hundred years ago and a fellow named Rudolf Steiner was the first one to point out in the early 20s that we really shouldn't be using all these chemicals on our land and our food and so this sort of became the beginning of the organic movement. The reason we don't want to use chemicals has to do with the way that they affect the soil life, which consequently ultimately affects our own health. So in the biodynamic method, we look upon a farm or a garden as a whole ecosystem. And so the farm has to have things like forests, meadows with ruminants like cows, sheep, and goats grazing. It needs to have wetlands and it's good to have bees and all kinds of a variety of animals, chickens and pigs and whatever, because these are the transformers of plant growth. They eat what the plants offer and then supply the manures that we can make compost out of to get our gardens healthy. Uh, Rudolf Steiner uh, was uh, born in Lower Austria and lived with the peasants and roamed the hills and learned a lot from how people farmed uh, in his youth would have been the uh, 1870s or so. And so he studied this uh, idea of using our senses and developing them so that we could really look at nature. And he studied nature intensely. And he then became a respected intellectual in academic circles in uh, Europe during the uh, latter part of the 19th century. But he was not a farmer. He was a lecturer and a teacher. And towards the end of his life, he gave lectures on agriculture, drawing from his studies in college of biology, chemistry, and physics, and applying this knowledge to what he had gained from the peasant wisdom that, from his youth. So he is coming towards agriculture 
as one of the most brilliant thinkers of his time with some peasant wisdom. And this comes forth through his book, Agriculture, which is a series of eight lectures. And when we look at this book, we continually run across sentences like, I can only give you guidelines or such, you know, and he was just trying to say this is the direction we need to go away from chemicals, we need to continue the wisdom that our ancestors had in the thousands of years that they learned agriculture and we don't need to drop that wisdom. We do have to recognize where superstition plays in and where logic plays in and just be aware that there's ways to look at nature much broader than is commonly done. So when we farm biodynamically, we're assuming that the plants are able to draw into themselves what they need. They know better. But to do that, they have to have their roots in very loose soil that is teeming with life. And then they're able to grow with their passionless growth up into the atmosphere. And these leaves then spread out laterally as the plant is growing vertically and they catch sunshine. And sunshine is uh, the hydrogen from the sun. That's coming from the farthest reaches of the universe. You know, hydrogen is a very interesting element. By far the lightest one. It's on the periodic table way at the top. And it's very light, very almost non-existent. But hydrogen makes up 98% of the universe. It's by far the most common element. So this omnipresent hydrogen then comes to Earth and joins with the carbon dioxide in the air and through photosynthesis makes sugars particular to each plant species. This then flows down the plant uh, through the phloem and this phloem is lined with silica and then the, the roots then are uh, connected to fungal hyphae that flow all the way through the fields. And when we don't till too much, this connection remains intact. And so there's a signal given through the plant, through these sugars, and into these uh, soil life, through these root exudates, that tells the soil beings what the plant needs to be healthy. The soil beings are living off of these root exudates and have an uh, inherent uh, investment in keeping that plant healthy because it's their food source. So if it says I need some potassium, then the, the, the hydrogen can go through the phloem of the plant to the silica covered fungal hyphae and change through ionic exchange exchange a hydrogen atom for the potassium atom which then can come back usually through the uh, help of calcium and comes back up into the plant through the uh, xylem this would happen during the daytime as tension uh, uh, increases in the plant at nighttime the tension relaxes and the sugars go back down again feeding the soil microbes and informing them of what's going on. So there's an inherent intelligence in nature. So when we farm biodynamically, we're farming with nature's intelligence. We're not looking at a book and putting on, through human intelligence, a certain amount of uh, fish emulsion or sulfate of potassium or something like this. We're actually trying to get the soil itself to be the intelligent not the human being. To grow the gardens here at Long Hungry Creek Farm, we put 30 to 40 tons of really good biodynamic compost on the ground every acre every year. And it may seem like a lot, but when we do this after year after year, we build up a stable humus 
that grows crops that don't draw in insects or diseases. The reason is because those things, insects and diseases, come into our plants because the plants aren't healthy and they're nature's uh, recyclers. They take the, they're an animal, so they eat the plants that aren't healthy and turn them back into soil humus. If we as humans can build up the soil humus, then there's no job for the bugs and the diseases. So how do we build a stable humus? Well, I had the good fortune of being raised on a farm. So I learned how to plow, how to till, all about tractors and animals from an early age on. And this knowledge then became very valuable when I got my own farm as a teenager. And we started to grow stuff. And my goodness gracious, it was a lot harder in Tennessee, where I live, than it was in Illinois, where I grew up, which had really good soils. So one of the things that they have in Illinois is uh, glacial deposits. And so one of the first things I had to do here was to put on rock dusts to remineralize the land. This land in Tennessee needed lime, rock phosphate. We used granite meal, green sand. We've filled around with basalt and a few of the other ones. And these we find to be extremely beneficial in soils that have not had a glacier for a million years. We have very old soils here. So that would be, this remineralization is important. We try to keep our calcium levels about uh, eight or 10 times higher than the magnesium levels and make sure we have adequate minerals. The next thing we have to consider is the biology. Most soils have lost the biology necessary to really make healthy plants. So we reinvigorate the biology by making composts. And this is uh, where we take the manure and hay left over from where we feed the 40 head of cattle that we have on the farm. Over the winter, we feed them the excess grass that our farm grew during the summer and we make compost piles. These set for several years, uh, and then we use that uh, to fertilize the, the land. So the farm itself is relatively self-sufficient. You know, farmers don't have money. We can't go buy things, so we don't buy much. We try to grow everything here. So all of the animals feed, well, and all of our food is grown here on the farm. A lot of what we do on a biodynamic farm is take care of ourselves. We grow food for ourselves because it's an, one of the dictums is that everybody on the farm should eat from the farm. That includes the animals too, of course. So we grow hay for the uh, farm animals and uh, this is where we make the compost. Uh, we add biodynamic preparations to the compost pile and there's a few sprays that we put onto the fields. The, once we can get this biology going, then we have to learn how to preserve it. And this is how we use no-till, K-N-O-W, till. We have to understand tillage. It is the basis of agriculture. The ground has to be worked up so we can plant a crop, right? So we're using chisel plow and a harrow. We're not using rototillers and moldboard plows. We drag it through the field and then we do the thing that's one of the hardest things for gardeners to do and that is nothing. We just simply let nature and the biology that's in the soil help to break down the cover crop that we just uh, ran over with the chisel plow. Then we go uh, crossways across the field with the chisel plow maybe uh, four to five days later maybe a week later depending on the weather you know how the rains uh, fall and we do this again and then the third time we put this harrow on the back we go through it and the ground is uh, ready to plant then we lay off the rows about uh, 
44 inches wide and we do this with a Farmall 140 tractor and we then uh, sow by hand and we step on the seeds. It's very important to get your seed to have a firm contact with the soil. We run the tractor the tires over it with the middle busters behind it and this takes our real fluffy soil and compacts it a little bit right where we're planting. We want that compaction because that draws subsoil moisture up through capillary action. Once we get our crop to sprout up then we straddle the rows and cultivate in an effort to preserve moisture. So on a farm like this there's no irrigation no plastic drip lines or anything like that. We do all of the uh, tillage and weed control by hose and uh, uh, light cultivation. And we don't use hoop houses and plastic uh, mulches and just, just don't use plastic here because it's a biodynamic farm. We want to focus on life, bio, and forces, dynamic. And so we're going to keep with nature. People have been growing food the way I grow it for thousands of years. We can look at old quotes from Virgil from before Christ where they talk, he talks about this uh, letting the land rest, the advantage of cover crops, practicing crop rotation, using ashes and dusts uh, to put on your field, and relying on livestock manures and legumes for our nitrogen. We have to be extremely careful where we get nitrogen from. The nitrogen is 78% of the air, but it's locked up. We can unlock it through legumes and animals. It takes life to unlock it. And so all farms had to have legumes and animals until they figured out how to synthesize nitrogen for weapon production in World War I. They realized how valuable this nitrogen for, was for fertilizing and consequently agricultural education shifted 180 degrees in the 20s. So nowadays people think you need to buy nitrogen, but that's not true. The nitrogen that we can create on our farm as a result of agriculture, not as an input to agriculture, this nitrogen is the most valuable for our farm because it comes from our animals' manure. The animals are part of the farm. We keep their manure and compost it and so that the farm gets exactly what it needs. All right, I hope you all enjoyed that from Jeff. Uh, remember, you can learn more about his biodynamic conference and pick up a copy of his new book by following the links in the show notes. Otherwise, like this video if you like this video. If you're not subscribed to this channel, make sure to hit the subscribe button. And if you are subscribed, make sure to know that you're awesome. Another way to be awesome, pick up a copy of the Living Soil Handbook at notillgrowers.com or a hat or other merch. Also, Dan Breesbaugh has a book coming out on seeds. You can pre-order that from us. And that goes to supporting this work, which is like a win on every level. Join us over at the Patreon community at patreon.com slash no growers, where I just announced a really cool project coming up. Or just hit that super thanks button. That works too. Super thanks to Jeff. Super thanks to you for watching. We'll see you later. Bye. Thank you.